Started. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Susan Colburn. I am the Associate Director of the Duke Program in American Brand Strategy. And it's an absolute pleasure and an honor tonight to welcome Rose Scott Muller. Uh, we're extraordinarily lucky to have her here to share her expertise with us. And for those of you who turned into the news today, you might realize that we're all the more fortunate to get her time. Uh, she is already taped for PBS NewsHour. So you're part of the jam-packed schedule. Tune in later. <laughs> um, before I introduce our guest, those of you who have been to an AGS event before know that there is an announcements portion of our evening. So I want to let you know about a few upcoming events being put on by the program in American Grid Strategy. On February 28th and March 1st, as part of the America in the World Consortium and in collaboration with Georgetown's Center for Security Studies, our director, Peter Bieber, is putting on a two-day conference on civil-military relations in the United States to mark the 50th anniversary of the all along the Force. And don't worry, I don't expect you to go to Washington, D.C. Uh, next week just for the occasion. It will also be live streamed, so go to the AGS website and you can get all the details about how to tune in for some or all of that event. On March 2nd, we will be hosting Or Rabinowitz, another Stanford uh, individual for a conversation on Israel's nuclear counterproliferation policy. So that'll be on March 2nd uh, at 5.30 p.m. in Sanford 05, right next door. We'll take a brief hiatus for spring break as we do our annual international staff ride to Italy. But then we will have two events the first week back on March 21st. Former National Security Advisor Stephen J. Hackley will be here to talk about the Bush foreign policy legacy and a new book he edited along with our very own Peter Fever of Manos from the Bush to Obama Transition. Uh, and then the next day on March 22nd, Naftali Bennett will be here. Uh, that event is ticketed, so make sure you go to the AGS website to find out more. Details on all of these can be found on the AGS website or on the newsletter if you are, for whatever reason, not already on our list of service. Um, but with those announcements out of the way, I want to get on to the more important business. It's an absolute honor to introduce our guest tonight. Rose Gottmuller is the Stephen C. Hazy Lecturer at Stanford University's Freeman Smogley Institute for International Studies and its Center for International Security and Cooperation, CSAC. Before joining Stanford, Gottmuller was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2016 to 2019 where she helped to drive forward NATO's adaptation to new security challenges in Europe and in the fight against terrorism. Prior to her time at NATO, she served for nearly five years as the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at the U.S. Department of State, advising the Secretary of State on arms control, nonproliferation, and political military affairs. While Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance, in 2009 and 2010, she was the chief U.S. negotiator of the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, New START, with the Russian Federation, something I have a hunch we might want to spend a few minutes talking about today, given Vladimir Putin's speech earlier today. So the, we'll do this in sort of normal format, uh, conversation style. I'm going to kick us off by asking Rose a few questions about Russia's war in Ukraine and the broader implications for European security, sort of thinking about what the conflict means over the past year and what it means going forward. And then we'll turn to audience questions in the last 20 to 25 minutes. So I wonder if we can start by, maybe you can take us back to early 2022 for a moment, before February 24th, when Russian forces invaded Ukraine, widening the war first began in 2014. Both before and after that date, there has been considerable faith about the origins and causes of the Russian war. And so I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what your thinking was then about the prospects the Russians would invade neighboring Ukraine. How has your thinking about the origins of the invasion, the causes of the invasion changed in the last year, if at all? And what do you see as the major motivating factors in Russian thinking? Let's start with the major motivating factors, which I think uh, are very much in Vladimir Putin's head. They have to do with his desire to recreate a Slavic heartland. He's been uh, very clear about that. He said it again today in his uh, in his remarks that uh, 
reverberated so among the community who was concerned with where we go from here on this terrible war in Ukraine. But he, um, so I think that he became so isolated during the COVID pandemic because my earlier experience of Vladimir Putin, believe me, you know, I, I was always way down the total pool in protocol terms, but I often was in meetings where he was talking to our president or you know, he was president, and he always had a very pragmatic streak to him. Indeed, as I mentioned this morning, when somebody asked me, he was very tough during the negotiation of the New START Treaty. He was the prime minister at that time. And Dmitry Medvedev, remember him? He was the president for that brief interregnum. And 2009, he was the president. He got along great with President Obama. So Obama and Medvedev were working together on the treaty. And, uh, and Putin was kind of skeptical. But afterwards, he came to see and he spoke publicly about the treaty being the gold standard of international treaties of these, this kind. So I saw that pragmatic streak in a number of ways, and he was able and willing to work with the United States, with NATO, to get things done. Again, in Russia's interest. He wasn't doing a favor to us, but in Russia's interest. And But that all disappeared. And part of it, I think, due to the isolation of the COVID pandemic, and he, he himself kind of spun himself into this uh, Slavic heartland dream that he wanted to recreate uh, Staraya Rus, Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, all being together. And seemingly nothing was going to stop him. So I, I really put down the, the issues as, as being so much focused on him and his motivations. People say, oh, what about the expansion of NATO? We can talk about this in the Q&A. I really, you know, even before I became Deputy Secretary General of NATO, you know, looking back to 2002, when uh, we had the NATO-Russia summit in Rome, and Vladimir Putin came to that summit with George W. Bush and the other NATO leaders, and he signed uh, the Rome Declaration, that launched a NATO-Russia Council, and it launched a big agenda of joint projects with NATO, very pragmatic things like stopping heroin exports or trying to stop heroin trafficking out of Afghanistan or enhancing the efficiency of the airspace in, European, uh, in the European skies. So there were a lot of pragmatic things that he signed up to during that period. But somehow along the way, that, that pragmatism got tripped up by resentment and got tripped up by this vision, again, of restoring the Russian imperium in some ways, but also the Russian heartland. So I'm, you know, people say, well, then why don't the Russian people rise up? And, you know, there must be something there that they're motivated to support this war. I think they just want to be left alone, to be honest. And that is the social contract that Putin laid down, first with the oligarchs, but then with the Russian people as a whole. You stay out of politics, and I'll let you enrich yourself, middle class, buy your car, buy your dacha, send your kid to a, a foreign boarding school if you want. So it was a kind of social contract that uh, you know he kept going, and and so people have stayed out of politics, and I think we're seeing the effect of that now. But I don't believe that the Russian people really really support this war. Uh, some do, of course. There are hardliners everywhere, but I don't think as a general matter they do, but neither are they going to stand up and say stop. So um, I guess I've been talking about factors of motivation. Remind me of the other things you'd like me to touch on here. I wondered about what your thinking was in, say, January or February last year about the prospect, right? We now know that ultimately Russians were going to invade, but we go back and think about the speculation in January or February of 2022. There was a lot of very intelligent people who had spent years studying Russian foreign policy saying, he won't do it. It won't happen. Let me take you back to a year ago today, uh, February a year ago. That was when uh, Putin had his infamous National Security Council meeting, when it was visible on Russian television that his top, his top leaders, his top leading public cabinet members, a lot of them didn't know that he really was going to go forward and invade. He took a lot of them by, I think, by surprise. So I see this as, again, a very kind of narrow group, but Putin was resolved to do this. I've heard, and again, you know, take this as rumors, but I've heard that even the top military leadership didn't know, and this was very much a security services, at least to begin with, a security services plan, a security services initiative, 
and then the military basically got pulled along and now of course are fully in the, in the fight. There's no question about that. But uh, a year ago, we really thought, and uh, I was on the outside of the government, but I know that US government was going to do everything it could to deflect this war. Now, the, the intelligence organizations in the United States, and to our credit, we were getting the word out that troops were massive. Equipment was being brought forward. The Russians looked like they were preparing an invasion. So our intel people were sure the invasion was going to take place. But nevertheless, we did everything we could to head it off. And even on January 7th, uh, the Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, went off to Geneva with a package of, when you look at them, they're pretty reasonable proposals, not accepting the kind of crazy demands that the Russian government threw down at the end of 2021, like NATO should withdraw to 1997 borders, or Ukraine should demilitarize. So there were a bunch of crazy things in that so-called European security deal that, that Putin threw on the table. But there were some things that the USG said, all right, let's try to work. Let's try to work on restoring limits on intermediate range nuclear missiles. Let's work on strategic stability topics. Let's work on some areas that are, again, in our mutual interest and try to move forward. But it was evident that at that point already, Putin was hell-bent on moving forward with this invasion. And the, the answer came back within a few days of January 7th. This is a package. You got to withdraw NATO to 1997 borders and all the other ridiculous things that were in that package. We're not going to let you select a few things that you consider uh, important or in your national security interest. But that's the damnedest thing for me, you know, that it's in the mutual security interest of Russia and the United States to proceed forward on some of these strategic stability initiatives. We can come back to that again. But, but that's what I was thinking, along with government colleagues, that you know, we'll try our best at the diplomatic table, but if they're not going to pick up the deal, then there's nothing we can do. Yeah, that's that's really, really interesting to hear you talk about. I don't, I don't know if you want to touch on the deterrence efforts that we had underway. Sure. Yeah, the other thing, of course, is that we were clearly doing everything we could as a country, along with our allies and partners, to try to send deterrence messages already starting with sanctions and messaging the sanctions that uh, would affect Russia. What to me has been so positive about the last year is the degree to which uh, the international community has been willing to, to ramp up the sanctions regime far beyond what I expected, to really ramp up uh, the constraints on the Russian gas and oil exports in a way that has caused our allies and partners in Europe to scramble to replace Russian gas and oil. But now you look at Germany, LNG plants all the time and, and really, you know, dropping this long-standing dependence on, on Russian petroleum products. So again, uh, in many ways, the Russian Putin has been shooting them, they've been shooting themselves in the foot in the last year, losing their, you know, losing their 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 uh, customer base for their products. But nevertheless, the United States during that period, working with allies and partners, was going full, you know, full force to try to say. If you do this, this is what is going to happen in terms of economic sanctions, and it didn't make any difference at all. Yeah, and it was clear uh, just how quickly the sanctions sort of snapped into place, how much lead work had been done on the Western side. I mean, you think about some of the banking uh, regulations that came into, into force last February. I want to stick with the conflict itself for a moment and then sort of zoom out to talk a little bit about the broader implications for Ukraine, for Russia and for NATO and European security. But um, so if we, we started just with the origins of the war, I want to take us up to the present. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you would describe the conflict at its present point. What are its sort of defining features? What do you see as major trends or possibilities? I know predicting the future is hard, uh, but to, to sort of see what do you see as significant in what's taking shape today and what might be red herrings? Stalemate is the most common word you hear to describe uh, the, the um, war as it stands today. And I, in some ways, I agree that that is the case, but I think it, it is important to look behind the scenes to consider exactly what's going on. 
the Russian Federation has been losing um, men, and I stress men, there aren't any women in the Russian Armed Forces except in some niche positions, but they've been losing men at a tremendous rate. And also, of course, then they their demographic crisis already in existence is also being exacerbated by the number of people who are fleeing the country, voting with their feet, particularly from the high-tech industries. They're, they're really losing a generation of very, very capable people due to this war. So they've been taking tremendous losses in many, many ways. I say that because uh, you know people talk about mobilization, a big mobilization coming. I'm not sure how much capacity there is to you know, pull in a lot of personnel from a big, a big new mobilization, unless they cut into those people who have received so far a pass because they're working in high tech industries or other critical industries. So, so I think that they have limited capability to pull more men into the into the battle space, and also they have. I I heard they seen seven thousand tanks destroyed. In this war, so they ground up a lot of their of their heavy equipment, and everybody says, "Ah, the spring offensive is coming." I took great note of what the UK uh, uh, Defense uh, Secretary said at the Munich Security Conference this weekend, when he said they ground up so much of their capability. We in the UK are not certain that they are capable of launching a new offensive this spring. At the same time, you see now the Ukrainians have been under tremendous pressure too, and have taken a lot of losses, but they are acquiring new capability, new capacity, including heavy armor, including the ability to move uh, to move troops forward rapidly. So that kind of mobility that may in, in, enable them, in fact, to be the ones who launch the spring offensive. So we shall see. Uh, but in the end of the day, to my mind, it looks like at the moment the Ukrainians militarily are on the front foot and the Russians continue to be on the back foot. Uh, perfect segue to my next question. Uh, so obviously, if we think about how people talked about what conflict might look like uh, last year, there was widespread speculation that Ukraine would be quickly overrun by Russian forces. We know that that's not what occurred. And the Ukrainians have put up a, a remarkable uh, a remarkable fight against the Russian invasion. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how Ukraine's performance defying early expectations on the battlefield has changed or transformed the conversation about Ukraine's place in Europe. One of the things I'm actually very proud about yeah. is that after the 2014 invasion of Crimea, which was the first phase of this invasion, by the way, it's a Funny little vignette, but when I was a, uh, uh, was the Undersecretary of State in 2014, the lawyers were telling us you shouldn't call this an invasion; it's an incursion, because an invasion has something you know particular in legal terms associated with it. And I thought to myself, this is an invasion. But just <laughs> just so you know, the official talk was somewhat different. So, but in 2014, that really launched a tremendous effort by NATO allies to begin to train the Ukrainians. Certain NATO countries took the responsibility to begin training at a high intensity. The Ukrainian armed forces uh, have a lot of response. Is this working all right? It seems to be kind of going up and down. You guys hearing me all right in the back? Okay, good. Uh, the, uh, the Canadians, for example, have a lot of Ukrainian Canadian citizens and other countries where there's a large Ukrainian population took a lot of responsibility to train up the Ukrainian armed forces. And that is, I'm very proud of that because I think it's one of the reasons why the Ukrainians were so good at this um, really, uh, you know, urban warfare that uh, enabled them to, to throw the Russians out halt their blitzkrieg and then in some cases throw them out of the country like in the northeast around Kharkiv. So um, there, there was a good deal of capacity already developing. It looked um, a good partnership, I would say, developing with, with NATO to increase the military uh, capability and savvy of the Ukrainians overall. So already a good between NATO and Ukraine, a group of mutual respect was developing, but it wasn't visible to the rest of the world. And now uh, people have been very impressed with this, uh, as President Zelensky likes to say, their David versus Goliath performance that they've done very well, but like David with Goliath, they haven't yet been able to 
deliver the coup de grace of uh, you know the stone right to the forehead. Mm -hmm. So they have to continue the fight, and I think that they've earned tremendous respect from the international community because they've shown themselves very professional in many ways, very much a modern armed forces, and also able to absorb uh, with training, but absorb new, new capabilities uh, very, very quickly. So uh, I think in general, the Ukrainians have, have, uh, have done very, very well over the past year. Now the issue comes up about corruption and what is you know going to be uh, the future of uh, the Ukrainians' ability to absorb these capabilities and resources coming in, they do have a history of corruption in that country. So that's going to be something that there'll be a lot of attention to, certainly from, from our Congress, but also from uh, from the other donors, from the other NATO countries. That, you know, last thing I'll say on this is Ukraine wants to become a member of, of the NATO alliance. That's one thing that apparently has been an impetus for Putin to try to keep uh, Ukraine pulled them close, but I like to say it wasn't only NATO, it's also their European Union membership, because back in 2014, it was their, their uh, willingness to sign up to the association agreement with the European Union, that, that was the, the trigger to the invasion of Crimea at that time. So um, it, it means to me that uh, the Russians have this um, uh, this desire to prevent Ukraine from moving to the West, from becoming a true European country, and, and Putin, I think, feels very much that way. But uh, to get back to, to where I was with regard to corruption, both the EU and NATO have said to Ukraine, unless you get this national corruption under control, you will never become members of either the Union or the Alliance. And so for them, it has to be a top line priority to get a little more corruption, regardless of the critiques that will be coming at it from the United States, from the Congress, from other countries uh, who have been donors during this, this fight. So I wonder then about the sort of flip side, if, uh, if the Ukrainian performance in the war has changed some of the conversation around uh, Ukraine's relationship with Europe, earning them immense respect uh, from, from many of the NATO allies and partners, I want to turn then to what the war has meant for Russia. The Russian invasion, I don't need to tell anyone in this room, has been marked by mass atrocities and war crimes and a litany of military failures that puncture old narratives about the immense success of Russian modernization programs in the last 10 or 15 years. So I wonder, how do you think the Russian war effort has transformed the way others see Russia, see its place in Europe, see the threat posed by Russia? Uh, sort of what does it mean for, for Russia's place in the broader world? I think and I know that among the NATO allies, there's a huge amount of concern that this really shows uh, Russia's deepest attitude, that they cannot be still until they have restored uh, the Russian Imperium, which extended well into current NATO territory, Poland and the Baltic states, for example. So there's a good deal of worry among the NATO allies that this is basically uh, Russia being Russia, as it was for centuries. And uh, for that reason, I think that uh, that is part of the resolve of the NATO allies to be supporting Ukraine uh, in every way they can as the Ukrainians carry this fight, fight forward. But um, at the same time, I think there is a recognition that Russia's maybe not the maybe not the giant military power that we thought it was, particularly after this conventional military modernization that went on throughout uh, the last decade and a half. They spent a lot of money on modernizing their conventional military forces. And so I know from the perspective of the U.S. Uh, armed forces, we were thinking, hey, this is going to be a significant opponent. But it seems, and I've heard that the Russians have had trouble with corruption too, that a lot of the modernization efforts were really tainted and tinged by uh, the corruption and did not end up being as, uh, as complete or as effective as, as they should have been. And that, uh, you know, we see that the Russians are even having trouble now getting uniforms for their troops. So there's a lot of issues out there that are associated, I think, with the corruption. So it's a co combination, I would say, Susan, of this sense that Russia is being Russia, and we got to be concerned that their objective of restoring their imperium has not gone away. But at the same time, 
oh, wait a minute, maybe the emperor has no, no clothes. This is on the conventional side. The nuclear side does worry me, and the nuclear saber rattling has been has been unrelenting since, uh, well, since 2014. It started back during that period, but then there was a hiatus and it started up again as Putin prepared to invade Ukraine. So I do think that uh, the nuclear force, the nuclear force structure is very capable. And uh, I think we have to be uh, continually worried about the modernization capacity in that, in that force structure. They don't have a lot of resources. They don't have a lot of money. But no doubt they will be spending uh, in the nuclear arena if they feel, and they will continue to feel that it's a good bet for them. It's interesting hearing you talk about uh, the sort of duality of that logic, right? The action has no clothes, but also it's a, a, a sort of part of the Russian modus operandi. I, I can't help but think of a whole series of Polish officials in the early 1990s who were making the case for NATO expansion and their own inclusion. In NATO, I uh, always used to use the phrase, I need to cage the bear. Yeah, I'm thinking about the emperor having no clothes, but he's got a nuclear clothes. <laughs> Even if he doesn't have any conventional ones, he's got nuclear ones, and uh, that's uh, that's dangerous. It's not quite the outfit we want to see someone in. Um, I wonder if we can zoom out a little bit and talk about the, some of the broader implications for European security, because obviously, though, uh, the fighting that's happening between Russia and Ukraine, we're seeing a huge ripple effect out in, in the broader consequences uh, and impact. And so I wanted to start by asking you to talk a little bit about NATO's response and how you would characterize, you touched on this a little earlier about the sort of remarkable degree of cohesion around sanctions, but could you talk a little more about what you see in NATO's response over the, the past year uh, and, and where it might be going? Historically, NATO always gets a bad rap for indecisiveness. And to my mind, what NATO has been able to accomplish over the past year in terms of providing uh, assistance to Ukraine, uh, military assistance, but also humanitarian assistance, and NATO countries supporting the Ukrainians who have been fleeing and giving them safe haven, especially in places like Poland. Poland has been stellar in this regard. But um, it belies, uh, I think, the notion that uh, NATO can't get its act together, can't make decisions, can't move forward. And the best example I'll give of this is the, the so-called um, uh, defense contact group that's been meeting regularly at Ramstein Air Force Base, sometimes more than twice a month. General Austin, our Secretary of Defense, was just there a week before last. At every one of those meetings, the NATO defense ministers have gotten together and decided on the next tranche of military assistance to Ukraine. And so it has produced this steady flow. There are fits and starts, like there are difficulties. You're, again, welcome to rate period. But uh, it is impressive to me that NATO decision-making has been uh, has been pretty fast moving during this crisis. And I think that belies the historical uh, picture of NATO as you know, not being able to get its act together and not being able to move quickly uh, because decisions are always made by consensus. The point is, there's a very strong consensus, I think, among the NATO allies. First, that they don't want this war to turn into World War III. They don't want it to turn into a general war in Europe. So they will be cautious about escalation. But second, that they are going to do everything they can to support Ukraine as they carry forward uh, this uh, military operation and, and try to throw the Russians out. I would say anybody familiar with uh, NATO's history should know that it's really hard to get that many countries, large and small, to agree on virtually anything. So it might seem a little unruly, but this is less unruly than other, other periods in the alliance's history. Um, I, I want to touch on two, two subplots, maybe, of the, the NATO story. Uh, and so first is about Sweden and Finland. Uh, so obviously, in part based on changing calculus as a result of the Russian invasion, Sweden and Finland have chosen to change course and throw their lot in with the alliance. How significant do you think that move is for the broader geostrategic landscape in Europe? It's hugely significant. It turns the Baltic Sea into a NATO lake, essentially. You know what kind of stock the Russians put in dominating the Arctic regions, polar regions, and the north in general, all of a sudden they will be operating on 
NATO troops in the Baltics. And uh, that, I think, is a, an enormous change for them. Going further north, I think it is important that uh, Sweden and Finland are very capable of Arctic operations fighting in the north. Um, we have, I have to say, in my time at NATO, we have had a somewhat less than stellar history of that experience of Arctic operations, just because, you know, NATO had been in Afghanistan for 20 years and had not had to pay as much attention to operating in the far north. I took part in an exercise in Norway in 2018 where um, NATO and, you know, countries came from across the alliance, as they do from Albania in the south all the way up to Norway in the north. But, the uh, you know, a lot of the units were not prepared for cold weather operations, and they cleaned out the athletic stores in Norway to buy warm weather gear. It got so bad that Norwegian grannies were knitting socks and handing them out to the troops at the roadside. So it was the case, and it really woke NATO up to the fact that needed to do a lot more to be ready for, uh, for Arctic operations. And so having Sweden and Finland come in, it's great in pragmatic terms uh, for NATO and the ability to, to be able to, to deal with uh, the Russian attempts to dominate, for example, uh, the Ocean, um, North, North, uh, what do you call it, the Northern um, Transportation Route across the northern part of, of Russia. Not that, that NATO would contest that because it is uh, Russian territorial waters in many ways, but on the other hand, to be able to ensure safe passage for, for ships uh, traveling through that, that area. And so to make a long story short, I think uh, Sweden and Finland will be a, a great benefit for the alliance. But before Sweden and Finland can join, uh, they need to be admitted. Uh, and so we have a sort of grand narrative that we've talked about here about NATO cohesion and the remarkable degree to which the alliance has hung together, despite some disagreements around the margins about when and where to provide weapon systems. Uh, but there are maybe two big caveats to that story, uh, Hungary and Turkey. Uh, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about where they fit in the NATO puzzle about how the alliance has responded to the war. Well, there's no question that uh, President Orban in, in Hungary has not been as enthusiastic, for example, as the Poles have been in, in supporting the war. And they have had a longstanding dispute going on with Ukraine about, as they call it, the treatment of Hungarian speakers in, in a certain region of, of Ukraine, uh, abutting Hungary. So there's, there's a kind of longstanding tension there. But nevertheless, in general, uh, the Hungarians, Orban himself, have, have supported the war effort. They've supported the sanctions uh, put forward by the EU, et cetera. So that is good. I frankly think, you know, don't that this 100%, but I frankly think if the Turkey issue is solved, that the Hungary issue uh, will be solved as well. The Turkey issue is more complex. It really has to do with the long-standing um, fight that the Turks have had going on with the, the Kurds and the Kurdish, as they put it, terrorist organizations, and their feeling that the Swedes have been harboring, have been harboring some Kurdish terrorists. So they're trying to get the Kurds extradited to Turkey. This is a in a democratic state, a law-abiding state where there are certain strict uh, procedures and laws governing extradition. You know, the Swedes can't just go around those to satisfy Erdogan, and that's a good thing. And so I think they'll have to continue to work that through. I'm frankly wondering, uh, there are two factors here I think that are important. One is, and it's a terrible tragedy, but this earthquake has opened up the aperture for further intensive diplomacy between Turkey and a number of different countries, including with Greece, longstanding, differences there, but but with others as well, including the United States, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was just there the other day. So the aperture has opened up for diplomacy. That's a good thing. I think it can help to move this issue along. Number one. And number two, there are the F-16s that Turkey wants. The Turks always drive a hard bargain. To my mind, they are they're generally good allies in the NATO alliance and that they're ready to put forward their military operational capability in, in some ways that other allies are not. Other allies put caveats 
on providing their military capabilities to operations in the alliance. They're very good, very good allies from that perspective. But they also, you know, want something now. They're good bargainers themselves, but they want something from the United States. And that's this F-16 buy, also included uh, F-16 modernization kits they want. So both new aircraft and the ability to refurbish their old aircraft. So nobody's saying that that's part of the bargaining deal, but I think, I think it's definitely in the mix. And I think from the perspective of our Congress, it really must be part of the mix. Picking up on that thread about Congress, we've seen a fair bit of press speculation in the last few weeks about whether or not the degree of NATO support uh, and the degree of American support for the Ukrainians can actually be sustained over the medium and long term. Um, and so I wonder whether in, in U.S. domestic politics or in an alliance setting, what do you see as the, the prospects or potential pitfalls of, of sustaining that the support at its current rate? As always, U.S. leadership is paramount. If the United States is not there to lead inside the alliance, then uh, it's hard to maintain that, that level of coherence and that level of, uh, as I said, rapid-fire decision-making that we've seen over the past year. So I do think that the U.S. is very, very important. Uh, so far, we have seen, um, I think, the current administration able to make a really solid case for why this is in the U.S., national security interest because it is basically defending, not to coin a cliche, but it's defending our way of life from, uh, and Biden said it today in his speech, you know, we're defending our way of life against autocracy. Um, so I think that that is an important point that we need to make clear uh, across, not only, you know, directly to critics on Capitol Hill, but also to the American public and the other thing I think we have to make clear is just where these expenditures stand in the overarching U.S. budget, because I think there's a real concern that somehow these uh, expenditures aiding Ukraine are sucking resources, significant resources, away from the U.S. Uh, domestic agenda. And my understanding is that's simply not the case. It's a small fraction, for example, of what went into the infrastructure bill. So I think that message has to get out more now, too, that there's... Yes, we are spending a significant amount to help the Ukrainians, but it's uh, not really sucking the life out of our domestic programs by any means. Perfect. I want to ask two more questions with an eye of looking forward and, and then throw it open to the audience. So one of the biggest questions, it seems to me, is about the future makeup uh, and membership of NATO and whether the so-called open door policy is really a policy of open doors to new members like Ukraine, Georgia, and others interested in joining. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how you see Ukraine's relationship with NATO developing in the months and years ahead, and Georgia's for that matter. Good. You may know from the Bucharest summit in, in uh, 2008 that four countries were put on the list for uh, aspiring to NATO membership, Ukraine and Georgia, of course, but uh, also uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, the fourth now. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. My NATO days are a little bit behind me, but anyway, it's in the Balkans. Uh, so there were four states put on, put on the list. And um, in addition, we have now seen two other states in the Balkans enter into NATO. One is Montenegro, and the other is the Republic of North Macedonia. So there has been an uh, addition to NATO membership in the ensuing in the ensuing years. But when I talk about this, I like to recollect for people. And if you ever get to go to NATO headquarters, you students, some of you may have you know chances for study in, in Belgium or in Europe. If you go to NATO headquarters, check out monument out front to the NATO uh, membership because it shows the timeline. And for example, Spain did not become a member of NATO until after the death of Franco. So in the mid 1980s, it became a member of NATO after the original entrance came in in 49 and then through the mid 1950s. So I like to point that out and say, NATO membership can be a long game and you just need to keep 
you know, keep the objectives out there, keep the goals out there, and keep working at it. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know what the prospects immediately will be for NATO membership when this war winds down. I don't know what Russia will be like. And that is a factor here, obviously. Um, you know, who knows? Uh, uh, I don't suspect that the next president of Russia, and I'm not predicting Putin's going to leave anytime soon, but I don't suspect that the next president of Russia will be uh, all that enthusiastic about Ukrainian NATO membership. But on the other hand, I was really surprised when Helsinki and Stockholm announced they were going to join NATO and Putin shrugged and said, well, I don't care as long as you don't buy any new or build any new infrastructure in those two countries. So, you know, it's very unpredictable at the moment, Susan. So, but what I always say to the Ukrainians is, and to the Georgians as well is, you know, keep working on preparing yourself to come up to NATO standards in all respects. And that includes dealing with corrupt practices and just keep working at it and we'll see when it is possible for uh, for that open door promise to be fulfilled. But I think it's absolutely necessary to keep the door open and keep the promise on the table. Yeah, it's hard to escape also the, the realities of having so many Western weapons flow into Ukraine that even if Ukraine does not in the immediate become an Article 5 member of NATO, their association with the alliance is, is perhaps much closer than uh, Russian policymakers might have wished in the uh, the initial thinking such as there was any about the invasion. That's a great comment because honestly, so much of what Putin said he wanted, it's 180 degrees different. He said he wanted less NATO. He wanted the NATO borders back to 1997, get rid of all those Warsaw Pact countries now members of NATO. Instead, what he has is two more major powers joining NATO, Sweden and Finland. And in addition to which, he said he wanted, you know, yet less United States in Europe. And what he's seeing is, is more United States in Europe with the investments that the United States is making in, uh, additional support to NATO itself. So it's, it's really, you know, again, shooting self in foot in, in so many ways. Yeah, we, we've seen a proliferation of internet memes, I think, in the last year. Uh, but one of my favorites is, as I was Vladimir Putin, NATO salesman of the year. And I want to ask one last question, maybe taking us up to today's news and, and where you see things going. Um, elsewhere, I've seen you describe Russia as, I believe I'm quoting you here now directly, a very large nuclear pariah state. Uh, and so I wonder, how do you see the prospects for future relations with that kind of Russia? What are the risks and dangers you worry about with a perhaps isolated uh, but still very nuclear armed Russia? And how does today's news uh, about Putin's desire to suspend New START change your, your thinking or confirm what you already were thinking before? Let me start with just a, a moment of history, and that is after the Cuban Missile Crisis 60 years ago, this past October, the USSR and the US, I think we, we were really, we were really frightened, quite honestly, by the, the nearness we came to nuclear holocaust. And so the two countries began working very, very quickly in the 1960s on putting in place a regime of negotiated restraint, starting with a limited test ban treaty in 1963, but proceeding quickly to negotiation of non-proliferation treaty, finished in 1968, and then on to the first strategic arms limitation agreement that was signed in 1972, along with the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. So there was this kind of, I would say, burst of momentum out of the Cuban Missile Crisis and this, this really burning fear of nuclear holocaust that drove not only the United States, but the USSR to be very responsible at the negotiating table at a time when I, as I said, you know, the, the Russian air defense troops helping the North Vietnamese were shooting American pilots out of the sky over Hanoi. And we were really at odds over the Middle East as well during that period. But nevertheless, we could continue forward working toward constraints on nuclear weapons and preventing another nuclear crisis of the kind we saw in 1962. So fast forward to today, and, and I want to say that in my view, Russia has been a giant of the non-proliferation regime. They were there right at the creation, and they have been very responsible about advancing the objectives of the regime overall. 
What I'm worried about now with Putin basically turning his back on the responsibilities to the New START Treaty, I'm worried about the notion that become, as I call it, a very large North Korea with nuclear weapons. That is, you know, uh, basically they will have um, nuclear capability and capacity, state authority will be intact, but they will simply not play this responsible role in uh, the regimes of non-proliferation and uh, nuclear arms control. So that is what is really confirming, uh, concerning me and today's, today's uh, event seems to further confirm my, my fears, to be honest with you. So we're going to have to think carefully. I think we can work within the regime. And by the way, I think it's important at this moment for the other nuclear weapon states to step forward, including Beijing, who is modernizing its nuclear weapons, but in, in doing so is, is doing coming from a very low base. So their numbers are much lower than ours are. Russia and the United States each have approximately 4,000 warheads. And China today has about four, uh, 400 to 500 warheads. So, of course, the Department of Defense has said publicly that by 2035, they may have uh, as many as 1,500 warheads. That's still a lot fewer than 4,000 warheads. So I think it's now is the time, first of all, for China to start to talk to us about what it wants with its nuclear modernization, what its objectives are, how it thinks about maintaining stability as it builds up its capabilities. But second, to say to China, hey, it's not in your interest if Russia and the United States leave nuclear arms limitations behind and we embark on an unlimited nuclear arms race. It's not in your interest either. So you talked to Putin too, Mr. Xi. I would hope that would be the case. But, and by the way, President, uh, she, as well as uh, Prime Minister Modi of, uh, of in India, talked to Putin quite openly at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, summit meeting back in the fall when they were in Kazakhstan. I was actually very surprised, but they had both been very clear. And Wang Yi at the Munich Security Council, uh, Munich Security Conference this weekend, again said, no nukes in Ukraine, no nuclear use in Ukraine publicly. So I thought that was very useful, but that kind of clear messaging has to be coming not only from Washington and its allies, but, uh, but from the other nuclear weapon states and frankly, the global community as a whole. It's in no country's interest if we are again embarked on the nuclear arms race that we saw during the Cold War. Perfect. Uh, I will turn to our audience now. We have a microphone go that'll go around. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, it's just this thing working. All right, let's try. Yes, any better? Yeah. Cool, cool. Thank you. Um, and thank you for these insightful comments. I want to speak on the nuclear question for a while. It strikes me that part of the reason that our response has been so, I'd say, ro robust here for Ukraine, but certainly kind of incremental as far as there being moving goalposts about, all right, we'll give these kinds of weapons to Ukraine, we won't give these kinds of weapons, so now we'll give these kinds of weapons. Does the theme, to my mind at least, come from Russia's nuclear, nuclear Russian barrel nuclear clause, very least. And I wonder, if you worry that the fact that Putin's nuclear saber rattling has had some effect in modulating the behavior of the international community with regards to Russia and Ukraine is a bad signal to other potential bad actors in the world that if you have nuclear weapons, you can get away with things that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. I'm worried about China and Taiwan, for example. Yeah, I think I think that's a good a good worry to have. Uh, but look, I, I think of this in two ways. First of all, people say that we have been deterred from taking certain steps in support of Ukraine, but the Russians have been deterred from striking at all of the uh, you know basically the shipments of arms we've been sending in, and certainly striking at NATO territory. So that's uh, that is a kind of balance of deterrence, I would say, that people don't often recognize enough to my way of thinking. Uh, but the other thing is, I, I really, 
You're right. In certain ways, uh, there has been a great caution there, and that is linked back to the point I made a moment ago, the resolve of NATO and the United States not to see this turn into a general war in Europe and certainly not into World War III. Uh, so there, there has been a, a caution and a kind of, let's take this step by step, but also there's been a responsiveness, I would say, to uh, both the overwhelming Ukrainian demands, but also to the, the actual military progress on the ground as the Ukrainians have proven, halted the Russian blitzkrieg, they've reversed the Russian advance, they've actually chased the Russians out of the country, uh, in certain places, and have been able to reacquire territory, like Kherson was a great example this past winter. So I think there's a sense now of the nature of the war changing, too, from the kind of man-to-man uh, -man combat in, in the urban areas to getting out now to uh, think about uh, the notion of a combined arms offensive and what do you need for that? You need the ability to move troops rapidly with uh, with uh, uh, tanks and armored personnel carriers also responding to their need for air defenses because I don't think people predicted the didn't predict how, how brutal and brutish the Russians were going to be in terms of going after civilian targets and so getting the Ukrainians as much air defense as we can air and missile defense as quickly as possible this has been part of the evolution of the war itself and um, so, yeah, I take your point that maybe we were a bit too cautious at times, but I think also we, we were watching and seeing how uh, the war was, was evolving and what really were the, had to be the top priorities uh, to, to get to the Ukrainians as quickly as possible. Um, thank you so much for your uh, remarks. And so... Uh, I'm an undergraduate in the politics, philosophy, and economics program, so I know I'd like to broaden the conversation just a little bit. Um, you know, what really struck me was a comment that you made that really the, the spirit of this is that we're defending our way of life against hypocrisy. And so maybe that's not a compelling message for China, for example, but you know, there are many other countries in the world that are beyond Europe, beyond North America, that where this could be a conversation to be had. So this just reminds me of how last year 14 African countries abstained. In the UN General Assembly votes. Um, now, there's one we did one on Thursday. And I, as I understand, there's a lot of lobbying right now. The problem was in Africa last week. There was South African Russia just had a military drill. And the New York Times ran this article that said South African Russia are old friends. A war is not going to change that. So, you know, in the NATO strategic concept, it says that we're here to defend our 1 billion people. So, you know, what about the other 6 billion? Putin is the best salesman for NATO, but to whom? You know, how do we sell this idea of defending our way of life to the developing world? That is a really good point and a really interesting one that has been bogging me throughout this war over the last year. And that is uh, essentially NATO and the United States. Uh, they, they got so gripped with what was going on in Europe. I think they dropped the ball on the Southern Hemisphere. And Putin and, uh, well, indeed, China's been way with their the good initiative or whatever it's called these days and, but anyway putting a lot of uh, investment in a lot of resources in into the southern hemisphere and now Putin has really used every one of his information misinformation we used to call it propaganda resources to to turn the tide of opinion in the southern hemisphere and they really have picked up on this sense of resentment that this is a <laughs> This is a, a colonial war, a neo-colonial war. You know, the Russian you say, what? It's a, yeah, it's a neo-imperialist war, but it's it's you, the Russians, who are the neo-imperialists, not not NATO, and not so. But but clearly, there has been a real problem in that uh, the United States, I think, and NATO by not paying enough, uh, have lost this uh, this information. Fight. And so I hope that we'll see how, what happens with the US uh, vote coming up this week. But um, I think there's been a concerted effort now to really get the word out in better ways. But this, you know, Russia is very, and the US is far before it, was very practiced at tapping into the, uh, the post colonial uh, resentments in that part of the world. And there's, there's a deep, I think, a deep history there that it is kind of hard to fight back against. I mean, 
but I can't excuse the United States for and, and its allies for ignoring the problem for as long as it did. Um, I think you touched on this a little bit, so I kind of want to draw to a bit of more, not a hypothetical, but in a post-war environment, um, we've seen and heard a lot about Russian war crimes and crimes against humanity. Given how shaky and new the environment is for international criminal justice and the concept of that, in a world where, you know, given what we know today, is there a potential for that kind of like criminal response or criminal effort? We don't see it a lot against kind of big powers, but it is something we've heard a lot about. Well, it's a fair point that uh, Putin's never going to be extradited and, you know, uh, end up before a tribunal in The Hague, he'll stay put, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, and so there are limits to what the international community can do in terms of uh, bringing uh, perpetrators of, of crimes of this kind of justice. But I still think it's really important, a couple of things are really important, to have a very clear and uh, well-documented evidentiary trail. And I know that those who have been involved in this on the Ukrainian side and and on the side of the International Criminal Court have been working very assiduous, assiduously to ensure that evidentiary base is there. And then to really, you know, again, use the court of public opinion to try to make it clear that this type of behavior against crimes against humanity, but against uh, all the, the laws of war as well is simply uh, untenable and, and not uh, the way civilized, uh, civilized peoples behave. So I think just have to accept that you know people perhaps will not in the end of the day stand before the court, but nevertheless the crimes have to be documented and the case made in the international community that this is not the way that that uh, humanity is going to survive if we let these kinds of norms and standards drop uh, drop behind us. We, we just have to keep them up in every way we can. But yeah, it's not a very satisfactory answer, I know, but I do think it's important. It's important to make sure that when the day comes, we're, we're ready to, to make the case, even if we don't have the people standing before the court. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, I'm curious, do you have some sense, um, to, to take the term that uh, David Petraeus used some time back, how this ends? Is the West support for Ukraine um, basically uncaveated? If Zelensky, for instance, insists that the war goes on until they um, make an effort to recapture Crimea, is that going to be fine with NATO? Well, looking into a crystal ball, uh, I don't have one, sorry, but I will tell you what I think, uh, how I would think. End. This is my opinion and nobody else's. But I think that uh, if it were possible uh, for the Ukrainians in a strong spring offensive to drive the Russians back to the status quo ante, to the territory they occupied on February 23rd of last year, and uh, to be very clear in, uh, in coming to a ceasefire and beginning to negotiate that uh, the territorial claims of Ukraine are not going away, that there is no ceding of Ukrainian territory to Russia and Russia's demands, uh, that uh, on that basis, a negotiation might and could proceed, but I would not give up. And some people have said, oh, they're just going to have to give up Crimea. I don't agree with that. During the Cold War, Europe itself was uh, divided, of course, and, and we don't want to see that. But during the Cold War, we also never recognized the Baltic states as part of the USSR, we the United States and our allies. And so 60 years later, they became independent states again. So I think we just have to leave that principle strongly intact and then perhaps proceed to a ceasefire and to negotiate. Uh, but. I know that's not where President Zelensky's head is. 
So that's my opinion, but it is not where the Ukrainian body politic is at the moment. So in the answer, I'm not sure I can tell you how this ends. Hi. Um, hi, thank you so much for coming to talk on this topic. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to read because I paraphrase my questions all the time. So I just want to make sure I get everything out. Um, so more and more frequently, we have seen Putin and the Russian government thrash about battle, seemingly saying things to shock Ukraine into submission and its allies into reducing support. Moscow is feeling the pressure and embarrassed, and although they have yet to carry through on many of these, clearly we, have, we should maintain caution. I would hope that people there today see themselves as on the plight, on the side of the plight of you, the side of the Ukrainian plight. However, I would also hope everyone here today desires a scenario in which both sides come to the table and agree to peace. So here's my question. And you have touched on this slightly, so I apologize, but um, to what extent is it the responsibility of NATO officials, Western state officials, media, and other carriers of our presentation to Russia to balance an emphasis on the stalwart support of Ukraine while also allowing enough breathing space to stop feeding the Russian propaganda machine and also potentially making a peace settlement seem less like a defeat to the Russian government? And if you believe, like me, that we do have some role to play in this sense, how can we balance expressing consolation and support to a suffering ally while luring a, total a totalitarian cabal of egotistical war criminals to the table? No, that's an excellent uh, question and, and very well said. Um, I would say that the, <laughs> the Russian propaganda machine is on a self-feeding cycle. And I don't really believe that the United States and its NATO allies are feeding it. I think what, in my view, and, and you can look at today at Putin's speech and the way he's he's basically twisted everything around. So this entire war is the United States and NATO's fault and not anything to do with the fact that he marched his troops across the borders of Ukraine and, and tried to seize Kiev last February 24th and in the ensuing days. So he seems to have forgotten about the blitzkrieg. So I, I call it a self, a kind of self-feeding machine and certainly one that is very effective at, at twisting everything around and, and uh, getting out the opposite point of view. That book, 1984, constantly comes to mind uh, during, this, during this period, I must say. But I, I also think, and here's to your wider point, that we need to acknowledge that the Russian Federation has interests here. And that's why I'm so much emphasizing that I, I can't, I'm having a hard time understanding why they don't perceive their national security interests in keeping the Russia, uh, the U.S. nuclear modernization limited by the mechanism of a bilateral nuclear arms control treaty. Why is it their interest to, to see the U.S. start to build up its nuclear forces? I, I don't understand that. So um, I think we do need to acknowledge that the Russian Federation has interests, uh, but they cannot be interests that that uh, that snuff out the interests of other countries. And so, therefore, we have to also be sure that Ukraine's interests are served. Well, on behalf of uh, four Ukrainians and you, myself and Tatiana, thanks a lot for the conversation. I have a very quick and simple question. When F-16? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Really. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'd be interested. Hold on to the microphone. Why do you, why do you think the F 16s are the most important thing right now? Oh, I will not read. I don't know. Jets. <laughs> Jets. Let's. We're out of the airplanes. We have pilots, we have trained pilots, but we don't have airplanes. Um, and large, yes. <laughs> Sorry, we need, uh, um, I guess, we need F 16 because Ukraine is largely out of airplanes and we are not able to cover our skies with the limited air force that we have. This is why we are in dire need for new airplanes. Yes, I've, uh, I've understood the arguments about uh, the requirement for, uh, for controlling the air, airspace, air superiority throughout. I've, again, I think it's back to the point I made earlier about where the priorities uh, should be placed. And so I do believe that continued emphasis on integrated air and missile defense uh, is, to my mind, 
more important than, than air superiority provided for by fighter aircraft. But I know, again, your president feels differently. Your president feels differently. It's, it's the wings of freedom. We need wings of freedom. So um, we'll see what happens. Uh, I think NATO is perhaps inching in that direction. Uh, I know that UK has offered to provide uh, fighter uh, training to uh, Ukrainians, fighter pilot training to Ukrainians. So we'll see where things go. But at the moment, integrated air and missile defense plus the heavy heavy armor, the tanks, the um, the uh, means to move troops forward rapidly to uh, to effect to implement a spring a spring offensive. To my mind, that is also um, very very important. So anyway, we'll see where it goes. Hello, um, sorry, I'm not particularly good with microphones. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. <laughs> sorry. Um, first thing, thank you so much sharing your opinions. And as somebody who's a historian who studies the history of US-Russian nuclear diplomacy, I have a question that kind of goes back to your past when you were working on uh, proliferation and nuclear issues. In the 1990s and the early 2000s, the Russian foreign ministry and the US Department of State were able to strike up a good level of relationship that often allowed complicated issues to be worked through. Um, but recently, in the past few years, especially after the war in Ukraine, we've just seen dramatic changes. I'm thinking of Dmitry Trainin, head of Farm Institute Moscow, who endorsed the war in Ukraine. This is somebody who's played a key role in US Russian nuclear diplomacy. My question for you is given your past work and your past experience negotiating these figures in the Russian foreign ministry and other parts of the Russian government, what do you think led to this change? Why did all these people who made their lives focus on achieving nuclear disarmament or working to arms control these other nuclear issues, decide to just walk along with and to endorse this um, and to in, go full and to fall and endorse the invasion and the terrible crimes that have come with it. What did Trenton do exactly? Um, the deputy, well, yeah, he was the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center, the Carnegie Endowments Moscow Center. And believe me, I ask myself that question every day. I was myself the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center in 2006, seven, and eight, and Dmitry Trainin was my deputy during that time. We worked very closely together, and I always thought he was a very good um, analyst. He wrote a lot about uh, security, security in Eurasia, including uh, about uh, the China-Russia relationship. Excellent analyst. Um, so I was myself puzzled when suddenly he decided just, and, and by the way, oh, before the war, this gets back to our early, earlier discussion of nobody expected it. He wrote an op-ed in which he said, Russia is not going to invade Ukraine. And I, I said, what? Because again, we had all the intelligence. So, so I think he was a bit taken by surprise. But then the decision, I think, of so many Russian people has been simply, well, I'm, it's that old bargain I talked about uh, at the beginning. The bargain is you keep your, your nose out of politics and just keep your head down and the economy will you know, provide you a reward. Uh, I want to talk about that for a minute because I think that, that bond's being broken now, uh, depending on how bad things get with the Russian economy. But I ask myself that question every day. How, how were we able to be so productive for so many years, starting with the Cuban Missile Crisis? You know, ups and downs, clearly. During the early 80s, it was a bad period, the period uh, when the Politburo was dying off year by year, and uh, Ronald Reagan came in and had great concerns about the evil empire, as he called it. So that was a hiatus period as well. So it comes and goes. but. Nevertheless, there were always some lines of communication open between Moscow and Washington, and that's what concerns me now, as we seem to have really, really tightened up uh, the lines of communication in a way that we're not really talking to each other very much nowadays, and I think that that's very, very dangerous, but I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for you. I put it down to, again, you know, pursuing this, this objective he had of, of creating a Slavic heartland and everybody keeping silent and, and coming along with him and not being willing to stand up and protest. By the way, it's very interesting, the contrast with Belarus, where there were significant demonstrations after the, the presidential election was stolen uh, two years ago. 
and they actually have a government in exile now with the president and, and others, and they have beneath the surface a population ready to stand up and, and fight if need be and demonstrate. Uh, but that's not the case in Russia. There, in Russia, there's a sort of passivity there. Perhaps it's born of their history, but it's also, I think, born of this of this social contract. The last thing I'll say, and I follow uh, Jeffrey Sonnenfeld from Yale pretty closely, but he had a really interesting and I thought thought-provoking wrap-up of the last year in economic terms for Russia. And he said Russia's economic future is really dire. President Obama always used to say, jokingly, gas station with nuclear missiles. But uh, frankly, from Sonnenfeld's analysis, they really are getting to that point where, they, and, and they're losing the customer base for their, for their petroleum products. And they can turn to China, but they're selling to China and India at a huge discount. So they have, according to, again, Sonnenfeld, lost a great deal of income from their gas and oil sales in the last year. So I think that basis for you know keeping the, Middle class quiescent that they'll be able to continue to um, increase their economic gains that may be starting to fall apart now. We've got one last question up here. Hi, um, thank you again for being here. I was wondering, I was catching up with some reading earlier and going back to the UN question. The article I was reading was about the viable option of expo uh, expulsion, oh yeah, of the Russia's expulsion from the Security Council and the UN in general, because it did not satisfy the requirement to join the UN in the first place back when the Soviet Union disbanded in 91. So I was wondering, is this an actual viable option? And if yes, how would such a proceeding exactly develop? Without it, honestly, I don't think in the end of the day, and, and to be honest, you probably are more familiar with this issue than I am because I haven't really been following it. But to be honest, I don't think it serves anybody's interest to completely isolate Russia and throw them out of international institutions. We need to, to hope for a, a better future where Russia is behaving again more responsibly and, and ready not to be a large pariah state with nuclear weapons, but instead is, is willing to to return to the responsible role that it has played at times in the past. It's, it's a bad moment though. Apparently the instruction has gone out that in whatever international institution Russia is participating, whether it's uh, husband was involved in Antarctic treaty implementation of his career, an organization called the, uh, the, the Antarctic Treaties Marine Resources uh, Group, Camelar, and down, you know, down south in the implementation of marine resource controls in Antarctica, Russia's kicking up a fuss. And in the UN Security Council, kicking up a fuss and really trying to impede the operations of these international institutions. So I, I recollect back in 2014, Putin said, no rules or no rules. And that's part of the issue I think we're confronting here. Will Putin and Xi get to their new rules? And that is something none of us, at least I hope not in this room, want to see. I think we need that consensus that emerged at the end of World War II that produced our system of international organizations like the UN, but also the, the IMF, the World Bank, the other major financial institutions. Yes, they may need reform, but they need to stay intact in order to provide, we hope, for security and, and prosperity for the the largest majority of the population globally that we can provide for. So um, long story short, I would not throw Russia out of the Security Council, even though they're going to be really a pain to deal with. That note, uh, all that remains for me to uh, thank Rose for making an attractive Durham and joining us tonight. I hope you all join me in thanking her.